question comes up. Is our church dying? From 1990 till today, uh, those are the attendance figures. Uh, at one point, we had 250 people in the morning services. Uh, right now, we're running just a little bit underneath 150. Kevin's song. Is God dead? No, don't think so. <laughs> Is our church declining you can say what you like the numbers are what they are so the question comes up is it because we have a population decline the last couple of years we have had a about a 10 percent drop in our uh in the census in our area okay uh, is it simply because people are just heart of heart won't listen they refuse the gospel. Um, has God changed? Uh, he's no longer interested in saving people, and is he dead? No, I don't think so. And what if we're the problem? What do we do? How do we respond? Um, this is the time of the year that we take a look at our church, uh, the state of the church. Um, I think it's serious. I think we need to look at it. I think we need to think through. It's amazing to me, God's timing of everything, but sometimes I actually get to see it and figure it out. <laughs> to a small extent. We're in the middle of looking at the book of Acts. We've seen tremendous growth of the church. Shouldn't we see that here? Shouldn't we see that now? Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Um, honestly, this is discouraging uh, for me. Um, it's humbling. It's a challenge. But I do know where we go when we're faced with those things. So let's take some time and pray. Father God, we come before you, frankly, because we have nowhere else to go. <laughs> and I realize that you've designed it that way. This is your church. And Father we desire to see what you want to do in, through, to, upon us. Or we, we don't want to presume and we don't want to fall behind. Our eyes are fixed on you. Open our hearts, open our ears. Lord, may we, may we understand from the Spirit what is at stake and what you want us to do. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 6, we see the church has a problem. A rather severe problem. Right? God raises up a solution. Seven godly men, trustees, those who are financial, waiting on tables, and God uses 
them, uh, Stephen in particular in this chapter, in a mighty way. Um, looking good, now all of a sudden it's looking bad. He's accused of wrong things. He confronts uh, the leadership. And uh, God gives him a glimpse of what's yet further ahead. And then it looks like he loses. They win. He's dead. And we come to Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, what we read is this. It looks like the bad guys are still winning. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. Man, it looks like it's going worse. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And I don't imagine that the first response of the church was, wow, we get to move. Wow, this is great. My friends just died. Wow, my friends are in prison. My father, my mother, my son, my daughter, my spouse. I, I don't think that that was their first reaction. And yet, God uses this difficult time in the time of this church to shake them up, to move them, to fulfill his purpose, to bring greater glory to his name, right? Because what do we see? <laughs> Christ had given them a commission. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And where are they at this point? Jerusalem. They're still in Jerusalem. And possibly would have stayed in Jerusalem, except what? God allows persecution to come to the church, and the church scatters, and we see God's purpose fulfilled. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip. Okay, now we've talked about Stephen. Stephen was trustee number one. Philip's trustee number two. Right? The seven guys that they picked to minister to the Hellenistic um, widows. Philip's number two. He's not Philip the apostle. He's Philip the evangelist. Philip the trustee. Philip went down to the city of Samaria. What? I know, we read it and we think, oh yeah, that's like going to Bath or going to Savona. Or... No. <laughs> no, um, we don't have the equivalent. Right? If you, if you go really far with me, it would be like us sending um, a missionary to Las Vegas. Because nothing good happens in Las Vegas, right? It's Sin City. Right? Samaria for the Jew was bleh, never going there, right? Because they're half breeds and and there's problems and they go around Samaria rather than go through Samaria. Except for Jesus, who says, "I've got to go through Samaria. I've got to meet this woman and I'm going to present to her the gospel." And Philip, all of a sudden, as you're being scattered, he he realizes, "Wow, we got to go to Samaria." And he preached Christ to them. Now these are religious people, right? What does the what does the Samaritan woman say? Hey, should we should we worship where you guys worship, or should we worship where we worship? Because we think our worship's better. They were religious people. They were they had just gotten things off track a little bit. But Philip preaches them to them the truth. And the multitudes with one accord. That's, 
I don't remember how many times we've seen that already in Acts. With one accord, with one heart, with one purpose, they heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, many who were paralyzed, and lame were healed. Right? And so God's authenticating the message of Philip going to the Samaritans of all people. God must hate Samaritans. God's authenticating this message. Philip's there. He's doing miracles. People are understanding, wow, he's speaking from God, about God, and and his purpose, and about Jesus Christ, who we must trust in as our Savior in order to be saved from sin. And they respond, and there was great joy in that city. Great joy because of the amazing things that God was doing. <laughs> Mark, Mark, without any prompting, mentioned the fact, you know, if you're not seeing the, the, the smiles and the joy as kids are getting Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes, you're missing it. And I agree. And my question is, is, is there great joy in your heart over what God's done for you? Right? Because <laughs> realize persecution has come on the church, right? And, 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 and still there is great joy because the gospel is going out. Do we see great things going on here? Yes. We have um, Christmas in the park. We, we get to share the nativity. We have the game dinner. We've, we've got... <laughs> Numbers of people who are going out from Avoca, New York to the ends of the earth, right, on short-term missions trips. That's amazing. That is good news. That is great. There should be great joy. Uh, We see kids coming (laughs) to Awana and hearing the gospel and responding, right? We have VBS. We have Taekwondo. We've got uh, the Easter egg hunt. We have archery camp. Um, we've got soccer camp, we've got the block party, we've got uh, the family camp out, we've got Sunday school, and I ran out of pictures and time to get pictures together. Junior church, and we've got greeters, and we've got people who are doing great things. We've got people who are, who are helping to set things up and, and tear things down. We've got custodians and office staff to, to keep our building clean and to keep things going so we can communicate. There are great things that are going on. There is much to praise the Lord for. Yet, yet, we don't see significant numbers of people coming in to the church and joining with us to continue on to fellowship together. Philip had a problem as well. All right. Acts chapter 8, verse 9. But there was a certain man named called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. All right. So now, if you don't believe that that Satan has the power to mimic and to, uh, to do great things, miraculous, then you have not read your, your Bible, okay? Scripture is very clear that Satan has limited power in this earth, and as we get to the book of Revelation, we see that the, uh, the Antichrist, the beast, they rise up, they do tremendous things. How do you know if something miraculous is from God or from Satan. <laughs> you look at the fruit. You look at what is accomplished. Does it match up with what God's Word says? Is it accomplishing God's purpose and glory in this world? Simon did amazing things. <laughs> calling power to himself, calling attention to himself. You realize that they actually had a statue of Simon 
in Rome. This guy was so amazing, so great, had fooled so many people, had, had gathered together uh, such a following. And, and so, in some ways, this would be um, an amazing thing. Right? If someone so prominent came to know Christ, heart change. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Right? Philip's going around and he's preaching, look, you're sinners. You deserve to go to hell because of the things that you have done against God. Because you have raised yourself up and said, well, my way is good enough. I don't need Jesus Christ. I don't need him to die in my place. You see, that's sin. That, that's the ultimate sin. And for that sin alone, we should die. We should go to hell. We should be punished forever because we have rejected the Son of God. And yet, when the people of Samaria heard, the Holy Spirit worked in their heart. They repented of their sin. They trusted Christ as their Savior. They turned away from this one who was doing great things, but not for God. And they turned to the one true God and followed Him. Followed Him to the extent that they were willing to be baptized. Right? They, were, they, were, they would signify that they were buried in depth and raised to walk in newness of life, that they, their old life would be put behind them and that they would follow after Jesus Christ. Have you done that? Right? This is the church. This is what the church is made of, of those who have, who have trusted Christ as their Savior, who have been baptized and, and made a public confession that I'm in, I'm all in. For Simon, it looks so far so good. So we come a little bit further on. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. <laughs> Which is kind of humorous. Do you remember the last time John was in Samaria and people didn't believe and he said, Hey, God, hey, Jesus, do you, you want us to just call down fire on all these people? Should we just singe them? Should we scorch them? And God sends Peter and John back here. Who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So instead of praying that God would scorch them, God, they're praying that God would fill them with the Spirit. Say, hold it. I thought when we came to know Christ as our Savior that the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Yes. Right then, right there. But we're still in moving days, right? We're still in Acts. There's still transition going on. And there's a purpose for the transition, all right? For as yet, he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. All right? Again, God authenticating because, <laughs> believe me, it is like picturing the, the group of people that you find least likely to ever come to know Christ as your Savior. Okay? Um, Hell's Angels. Okay, so uh, maybe that dates me. All right? Probably does. All right? Uh, motorcycle gang, just they, they were tough, rough, and you, know, you just couldn't imagine that all of Hell's Angels would just come to know Christ as their Savior. All right? Um, you, you pick... You pick your group of people, right? For the Jews, that was the Samaritans. And all of a sudden, they made a profession of faith. So maybe you're trying to figure out, is Kanye for real? I don't have the answer to that yet. Right? The apostles are wondering the same thing. So they send Peter and John. Peter and John go down. They look. They say, wow. <sighs> could be. And all of a sudden, they lay their hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. And my guess is, is that he spoke in tongues. 
just like happened at Pentecost. And all of a sudden, the apostles are like, huh, I guess that seals the deal. These guys are really believers. The Holy Spirit has come upon them just like he came upon us. God authenticates that even, even Samaritans can come to know Christ as their Savior. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you. That, that, that sounds rather bland. Read it in the J.B. Phillips translation someday. Um, this is very strong. Okay, he, his response here is tough, rough, and, and harsh. Your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness. Pray if God, perhaps, the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you're poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. All right, so Simon had been a man of stuff, right? He'd been leading this whole, na this whole part of the nation, and, and they had a statue of him in Rome, and, and, and the Samaritans are deserting him. They're, they're coming to Christ. He loses power. And, and, and so he makes a profession of faith. He's even baptized. He follows Philip around. He sees that Peter and John have this great power over people. He gives them this amazing gift. It changes their life. And he says, look, give me that power. I'll pay you for it. I'll be honest. Scripture doesn't resolve itself as well as I would like here. Right? I would really like to know. What's exactly going did, did he... Did he come to know Christ? Is he just in sin? Here, has he, does he just need to repent of the sin and come back in? And I would tell you that my heart, which is usually soft and, and, and you know, willing to forgive, and, and, and I'm thinking, yeah, you know, he just makes a mistake and God's going to restore him. God does that, right? God did that to Peter. God did that to a number of people that we find in the New Testament. Um, but I think studying and listening and looking, and <laughs> I, I think that, that God's making a, another great point that there are people who come into the church and who make every appearance of being in the church, but their hearts are not right. And I, I'm fairly sure that there are those in our church, and I try and check my heart often as well. Am I following Christ? Is, is that the passion of my heart? Or am I just in it for the looks? Am I in it for the job? Right? Yeah. Because <laughs> Jesus had said that there would be tares among the wheat. Right, weeds among the true that would have to be sifted out, sorted out, and thrown out. And Simon, uh, evidently, again, not entirely positive, but look, we actually have a word in our dictionary for this guy, right? Simony. Buying a position of power in the church with money. And Irenaeus and several of the other church fathers actually say that Simon founded Gnosticism, okay, which was a heretical belief um, that you know you grew more and more close to God as you gained knowledge. We covered some of that in Galatians and and uh, uh, other parts in, in our, our studies, but. Um, I don't know. I don't have the definitive answer. What I do know is, is that we are warned and we have other examples where those come in among 
who do not truly know. Sometimes for evil purposes, sometimes I think they're just blinded and, and don't, don't yet get it. But we're to be on guard. Simon's answer is, Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. His real response probably should have been, I will pray. I will repent. I will change. I will ask God to cleanse my heart. So when Peter and John had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Did they believe that Samaritans now? Yes, Peter and John believed that Samaritans could now come to know Christ as Savior, and they preached among many villages, and there was great joy, right? We, we see that continue. Now, Peter, I mean Philip, let me get the right guy. Philip had preached among the Samaritans. He had seen all with one accord come to know him, right? Come to know Christ as their Savior. Uh, he um, had preached from a trustee. He'd become an evangelist, and he'd preached to crowds, and he'd seen crowds come. And then Acts 8 switches and shows us that Philip not only preaches to the crowds, but he preaches to the one, right? Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. Which is great. Because most of us, if God said, hey, leave the crowds, you're going to go just out in the desert and say, hey, look, God, I've got a really important ministry here. I can't, I can't go. Send somebody else. Not Philip's heart. Philip's heart is, where you send me, I will go. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. Okay, so evidently, Ethiopian eunuch has come up to Jerusalem to worship. All right, and I'll let you do the study and stuff. There's a lot involved in, in that paragraph, but evidently, at least a Jewish believer or interested in Jewish things, sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet, all right? And a helpful tip that I came across as I was studying was, we really ought to be reading God's word, even to ourselves, aloud more often, because we retain more of it as we read it. He was doing that, okay? And again, probably not a Roman chariot, just him driving, probably more of a cart, a uh, 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 a wagon that, that he's, uh, a group of people, they're going back, he's reading out loud. The Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? Which is amazing to me. He, he's reading God's word out loud, not fully understanding what he's reading, realizing that he needs help. And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture he, which he read was this. He was led as a, as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In this humiliation, his justice was taken away. Who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. He's reading Isaiah the prophet. He doesn't quite understand. He says, so the eunuch answers Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? And frankly, that's still a problem among the Jews because they would apply uh, Isaiah 51 to 53 to Isaiah the prophet before they would apply it to Messiah, Jesus Christ. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, here's a challenge for you. Can you take Isaiah and lead someone to Christ? Because Philip does. And he doesn't even have the New Testament. <laughs> Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. He must have done a very thorough job of explaining the gospel to him. Not only does he tell him that he needs to repent of his sin, that he needs to, to trust Christ as his Savior, but that, in, that what he should do as a result of that, not to be saved, but as a result of being saved, is that he should be baptized. It's either one really long chariot ride, or he's really fast. And, 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 and sharp. 
And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Hey, if we're talking about baptism, shouldn't, shouldn't I be baptized? I, I believe. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down and got splashed. Yeah, it's not quite with the whole purpose of that whole thing. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them, immersed them. And when they had come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, which is 20 miles up the road. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And I think God gives us a, a real picture of a contrast between Simon, who doesn't, who says he believes, but his heart is not right. Did you catch what Philip said? If you believe with all your heart, right? If your heart is right, if, if your trust is in Christ alone as saving you from sin, then you can be baptized. And you should be baptized as a step of obedience. And he, he takes him down and he baptizes him. Right? This is a great passage of Scripture. And again, uh, you know, we, we see what God's doing in the church of Acts. And, and the question, though, comes back to my mind. What about us? What about us? We haven't seen 5,000 people come to know the Lord in one day. 3,000 even. All right? And uh, I happened to come across uh, uh, Josh McDowell's son. Sean McDowell has a, a radio program that they did. They interviewed Glenn Stanton in June of this year. And uh, Glenn Stanton's thing is is that we hear a lot about how the church is dying the church general right young people are leaving the church by droves um, if you believe the latest greatest doomsayers within 20 years there won't be a church in the united states or, or, you know people are gone beyond that old-fashioned belief so Glenn Stanton's done some real research. He says, that, that is not, that is really not the case. He goes, that's what media is making it out. And when enough people keep saying the same thing, we start believing. Goes, that's not what's happening. Mainline churches, oddly enough, the ones who are trying to embrace everybody, as they embrace everybody, people leave their church they've lost five to seven million over the last uh, 14 years because of opening up their arms to everybody <laughs> really interesting statistic lgbtq people are more likely to go to a church that preaches against their lifestyle than to go to a church that's just covering over the gospel, covering over the truth. Because they find that if they go to a church that preaches the gospel, those people love them. They may not agree with them, but they love them. And they can recognize that there's truth. So what does that tell us? That we ought to, well, we, we need to get more lights, a bigger band, uh, fog, and uh, make a better show. This will draw all people to us. Okay? Um, no, because they would probably all be dying and choking on the fumes. Um, not a good idea in any way. Uh, should, we, should we change our message? Should we just open up? And obviously, that's not the answer. Not the answer. Um, All organizations go through phases, and most organizations can die, even churches. Right? The, the key is 
to catch as the decline starts and to start new birth, new growth. And it comes back to, to coming back to our purpose, okay? Our purpose is, we, we state, we are a church where people believe in Jesus for salvation. We fellowship in his family, we learn from his word, we grow as his disciples, we serve in his church, and we witness in his world for the glory of God. That can't change. <laughs> that is what God has mandated us to do, right? To be on the lookout for those who are perishing and to, to grab them, all right? That is amazing to me. Uh, Eric, if you just turn the sound off. Um, that the guy recognized that this guy is falling in time, grabs him and saves him. You know what the other amazing thing is? There are probably 30 people who realized that the guy had fallen. And just watched. It's our heart. We realize that our, our community, our friends are perishing, going to hell. Are we willing to rescue? Are we willing to work? Are we willing to, to see them come to know Christ? I, I, I'll be honest, I don't have a new plan. I'm really not sure we need a new plan. I do think that we need to be aware of what, what is going on. And I do believe that it needs to call us to prayer. It needs to call us to re-examine our purpose. It, it means we need to think through, are we missing some obvious things that, that we should be taking care of? There, there are you know, physical things and, and social things that, that, that can be barriers for people, and we need to make sure that those are not. But we really need to focus that we are doing what we're supposed to do. Right? Scripture's clear to us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible, full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So here's my best take that I can't become complacent, right? And that I can't complain, right? That, that God is at work. We see him doing things. But I, that I also can't overlook. And I've got to evaluate. It, it, is it me? And are there things that, that, that we can change that will help us better reach people for Christ and better bring them in to the congregation? My choice is to compliment, right? Which <laughs> has a dual meaning. Um, a compliment, spelled with an E, tends to mean in our language to come alongside, to help, to be about adding, okay, and bringing to completion. And so our choice should be to compliment what God is doing, to come alongside of what God is doing, and to compliment with an I, which means to speak well, right? To speak well of what God is doing. And that we should continue in the faith. We should be faithful. Our God is faithful. We should be as well, right? 
faithful to do what He's called us to do. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You for the opportunity to study Your Word. We thank You that You are not dead, that Your purposes have not changed, that, Lord, that You do what You choose, that You call men and women to know Christ as their Savior. Help us to be involved vitally in that and help us to, Lord God, we ask, we pray, that, Lord, we would not only be faithful in presenting the Gospel, but, that, Lord, that you would, you would favor us by allowing us to see men and women, boys and girls, come to know Christ as their Savior, and that you would give us the opportunity to disciple and to help them to grow. Lord, we ask, not because we're concerned with numbers, but Father, we want to be faithful in doing that which pleases you. Praise, honor, Christ's name. Amen. Just a couple of things to run by. Continue to pray for the persecuted church. If you've got a talent of being able to sing, uh, please make sure that uh, you look through the bulletin. Uh, the choir is meeting even this evening, and uh, they've got special music here in a few weeks. And if you could be a part of that, that would be great. Uh, tonight is our annual meeting. Um, I trust that you've been in prayer. I trust that you've read through the reports, that you're, you're thinking through that so that as we gather together tonight that you'll be ready to uh, follow the Lord's leading in those things. Um, Operation Christmas Child next Sunday night. Uh, opportunity for you to, to send a shoebox around the world to impact a world for Christ uh, and then be involved with the things that are around us as well so that you can be uh, sharing the gospel of Christ here. Let's